First and foremost, as you can see behind me, uh, I, I thought what a, a great opportunity to, to be able to put a skeleton there because I think it reminds us that we all have had or maybe have now skeletons in the closet. In fact, let me ask you this, moment, the, the, this question this, this morning. If I were to ask you to come up or to raise your hand and say, uh, hey, listen, would you please give me the skeletons in your closet? How many of you would be willing to do that? In fact, we've got just this little video that might just kind of tune you into this. Okay, I hope you enjoy that. It's a reminder that we have skeletons in our closet, do we not? Now, some of you are going to come up to me after church and say, Marty, I know who sang that song. <laughs> skeletons. If I were to ask you today, would you be willing to share those skeletons, I'm sure that none of you would raise your hand and say, you know what, Pastor, I don't think I want to open up the door and share the skeletons in my closet. I remember when I was going through my ordination many, 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 many years ago, and um, in fact, I'm thankful when Jim was here to preach a few weeks ago, uh, he did not, we actually talked about this, because he remembered how long my ordination was. And uh, there were a couple of things that I shared with those guys, and a couple of them looked at me, I said, listen guys, I thought when I stood before you, I needed to tell you everything. Well, you didn't have to. But I told them everything. And then when I was done, I said, now listen, I think that uh, this should be reciprocal. I think you guys should share as well what's in your closet. And they say, hey, listen, we're going to ordain you. It's already done. We're, we're out of here. They didn't want to do that. They didn't want to share their skeletons. Why is that? Why is it we don't want to share our skeletons? In fact, let me ask you this question. Right now we are in a political environment. How many of you are enjoying it so far? Really? I hate politics. i got to be right up front. I hate politics. You know why? Because we don't hear about what they can do for us. We hear about how dirty they are. Are you with me on this? In fact, if you watch the last debate, all of those questions or most of those questions about what do you think of this guy? What do you think of this guy? What about what you did way back in the past? You see, it, everybody loves to pull somebody else's skeleton out of the closet, don't they? Everybody loves a good scandal. Now, come on. You're all looking at me with this real straight face. You love it, too. How many of you, now come on, don't raise your hand. How many of you go around and talk dirt about somebody else? Everybody's now, nobody's looking at me now. But we like a good scandal. In fact, we'll tune into that. In fact, one of the moderators said this past week, hey, listen, we enjoy this. We, we, we need to know these things about you to know what kind of person you are. I'm coming to find out that it really is trying to find out who's the least of the liars. Isn't that what it is? Who's the least of the liars? In fact, when we talk about skeletons, when we talk about dirt on someone else, when we have these conversations, when we get in that moment of gossip, what we're really trying to do is make ourselves look better than someone else. Are we not, church? Y'all ever done that? Y'all ever tried to make yourself look a little bit better than somebody else? In fact, I thought this morning, and I'm not going to ask you to personally give me your skeletons, but I want you to notice this morning, I do have the whiteboard up here. And what I thought I would ask you is simply this. Now, you say, well, Marty, if I yell this out, someone's going to think it is my skeleton. Absolutely not. In fact, we're going to all agree that if someone yells out a skeleton, that's not their personal skeleton. They're probably talking about you. All right. So, if you would, just now, very one at a time, give me some skeletons that you might have or see in a closet. Greed. What's that? Greed. Greed. What's that? Pride. Pride. What else? Covetousness. Can I just write envy? I can spell that. Envy. I can spell that one. <laughs> hate. 
Huh? Hate. Hate. What else? Jealousy. Jealousy. All right, we'll circle that. Enviness. What else? Late. Whoa, that's a good one. Lazy. Huh? There you go. What else? Addiction. Okay. Now, by the way, you guys, uh, I, I spell check, so if you look up here, that's not a sin, not being able to spell. just want you guys to know that. Okay. What else? Anybody? Else? Huh? Cheating. What else? Huh? Abuse? What else? Gossip? What else? Ooh. What else? Self-centeredness? Uh, we'll, we'll circle pride on that one. What else? Huh? Stealing. Ooh. Hey. Okay. Well, you know what? Will you do me a favor? Will you turn? In fact, it's up on the screen for you. Let's see what Paul had to say about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, excuse me, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Paul makes a very important point, and he wants to emphasize something for us as followers of Jesus Christ. And I think it's important for me to share this with you this morning. I'm going to also ask you in your bulletin, if you do not have a bulletin, I encourage you to use a piece of paper, maybe grab one of those uh, offering envelopes there in front of you and use it, because I want you to take some notes this morning. It's very important. Notice what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version this morning. It's up on the screen for you, and this is what it says. Or do you not know? Now, I love it when Paul starts off like that. He says, hey, listen. In case you didn't know, I want to remind you, this is something that you need to know. So Paul says to us, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So here's the first thing I want you to write down this morning. Unrighteous. The right, unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. How many of you this morning got up and you looked at yourself in the mirror? Well, now, now listen, I know more than two of you did that. Everybody got up this morning, and every man that shaved this morning looked in the mirror. How many of you, when you looked in the mirror, you said, I am getting old, I'm getting fat, I'm getting ugly? How many of you said that when you looked at yourself this morning? Are you serious, really? I didn't. I looked in the mirror and said, thank you, Lord, for creating perfection. <laughs> and you know I didn't do that. You know, <laughs> you know I didn't do that. I looked up this morning and said, there goes another hair. I lost another one. But isn't it true? We get up every morning and we look at ourselves in the mirror. Did you know you, that you cannot lie to yourself? In fact, as I ask you to write this down, it says the kingdom of God cannot be inherited by those that are unrighteous. Many of us think that we're good enough, don't we? Come on, how many of you think you're good enough? There's a lot of people that are walking the face of the earth today that think they're good enough to stand before the throne of God. And the Word of God says that you're not good enough. It says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now let's see what else. Paul has to say to us. He says, don't be deceived. He's telling us, don't deceive yourself. Don't lie to yourself. In fact, let me share this with you this morning. If you're lying to yourself, if you're getting up every morning, you're looking in the mirror and you're saying, I'm good enough, I'm okay, I look great, I'm perfect. How many of you are married? I want you to look over to your spouse and I want you to ask her or him that question. And you'll get the truth. Now that sounds kind of humorous, doesn't it? But I want to take this a step further. How many of you have children? Why don't you ask your children if you're living the life that you're telling them to live? Well, wait a minute. Let's talk about our coworkers. Maybe tomorrow morning go in and ask your coworkers, say, hey, listen, what kind of person do you think I am? What kind of life do I display? Who do I exemplify uh, during the course of the work week? And then ask your friends. Those that you're really close to that see you outside of this church. Hey, ask them, say, what kind of person do you really think I am? Because I, you see, my friend, Paul says to us, don't be deceived. Many of us will try to deceive ourselves and try to say, hey, listen, I'm good enough. I'm perfect enough. 
And Paul goes on and he says, don't be deceived. He says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. Now, I had you do this for me. Now, does anybody see yourself in any of these skeletons here? Nobody does? Well, I see myself in there. I mean, I do. How about you? Now, let's, let's just, just take, take an easy, easy one, because many of us would never think of lying as a skeleton. Now, don't raise your hand, but did anybody possibly lie this week? Can you hear that pin drop in here? Cheating. Anybody cheat this week? Was anybody lazy this week? Now, you think about that. Did God have something for you to do this week? Was there some place you needed to be? And you said, well, Lord, that's just not me. Get somebody else. Hatred. Anybody hate somebody this week? You know, the Bible says that if you've hated someone, you've literally murdered them. Basically the same thing. Well, let's look here. Pride? None of us are self-centered. None of us, right? Are, are, you see where I'm going with this, church? Hey, listen, do you see some of yourself, the, some of those skeletons in your closet? Paul wants to remind us that we can find ourselves, if not carefully, being deceived. Now, let's go on and see what else Paul says here in verse number 11. He says, such were some of you, but you were what, church? Now, I want you to ask yourself this question. Don't be deceived. This is personal. This is for you. Don't ask anybody else. I want you to just, in fact, I want you to write down in your paperwork, paper, paper there, write the word wash, next to it put redeemed, because we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Ask yourself this, have you been washed, have you been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Only you know that. Only you know if you've, if you've actually done this or not. So ask yourself this question, you can write down yes or no, it's a very simple test. There's no maybe that comes with this one. Not sure does it count. So he says, so some of you, uh, so some of you were once there, but you're not there anymore because you've been washed, you've been cleansed, you've been redeemed. Notice what else he says. And you were sanctified. We're going to talk about these three points this morning. Sanctified. Ask yourself, are you sanctified? You know what that means? Set apart for Jesus Christ. Are you sanctified? And he says, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Spirit of God. Justified. I simply define that word just as if I never did it. Just as if I never did it. Now I want you to follow along. There's several verses up on the screen. I want you to write these down. Go home, study these later. We're going to go back to the book of Ecclesiastes. It's in the Old Testament. Chapter 7, verse 20. I want you to notice what it says here. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. So just in case you have deceived yourself to believe that you are perfect, just in case you've deceived yourself to think that you're good enough for God, I want you to understand that way back in the Old Testament, in the book of Ecclesiastes, note what it says here. He says, none of us are righteous. Now, what did, the, what did that verse say that Paul said? He said, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if none of us are righteous, that means we're what, church? Very simple. We're unrighteous. What makes us righteous? What makes us washed and cleansed? What makes us sanctified? What makes us justified? Paul told us it is in the what? Blood of Jesus Christ. So first and foremost, we must understand. So if I'm sharing with someone out on the street, I want them to understand when they say, hey, listen, Marty, I want you to know I'm good enough. I go to church every Sunday. By the way, nowhere will you read in the Word of God that it says if you go to church every Sunday, you're cleansed, you're sanctified, or you're justified. Nowhere in the Scripture will you find that. Are you with me, church? So getting the skeletons out of your closet isn't about coming to church. It's about what? Having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's being cleansed. It's been washed. So we must understand, don't deceive ourselves, there is none of us that are righteous. When I came into this earth, when I was born, and my mother looked down at me and she said, yes, perfection has arrived. And then I screamed for the first time, I was sinning. I didn't need anything, what I wanted was what? 
Did you know that when a baby is first born and it cries, you know what it's telling you? Come on, let's be honest. That baby is saying, I am self-centered and I want all of your attention. Amen, church, or oh me? That's right. We are born into sin. We are born into unrighteousness. So there is none righteous, no, not one. Notice in verse number 23 of Romans chapter 3 what Paul says. Paul says, for all have sinned. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if none of us are righteous, and Paul says in the New Testament, he says we have, we're all sinners. Notice what he says also in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Look here. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. As you look through the Bible, you will find out clearly where sin came from as it relates to man. What did Adam do? God told Adam what he should and shouldn't do, should and shouldn't do, and Adam and Eve, they decided that they would partake from what God had commanded them not to partake from. And what was the first thing they did after they got the skeleton in their closet, the skeleton called sin? What did they do, church? They tried to hide it. Don't we try to do that? We try to hide our skeletons so no one can see them. We even try to hide them from God, don't we? Even throughout life, from the beginning of time, we understand that sin is in the world. From the moment we were born, we were born unrighteous. We were born into a sinful nature. Now I want to give you one more verse. It's found in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. It's up on the screen. This is what it says. I love this. It says we are all infected. You see, when I was born, I was infected with sin. Look what it says there. We are infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. And I love the way the Word of God gives us illustrations. For me, it's easy to understand. Now, right now, we have the leaves that are falling. Do we not? Now, why are the leaves falling? Some of you say, because it's getting cold. <laughs> well, what would you say? They're dying or they're dead. <clears throat> so just like us, this is the illustration the Lord gives us. Hey, listen, we, he gave us life. And without the nutrients to sustain life, guess what's going to happen? We're going to wither and we're going to die. Now, he didn't just say we're going to wither and die, we're going to fall to the ground. What did he also say? He says it's going to blow away like the wind. Now, there are so many people that think they're somebody. This past week, when Susan and I returned from our vacation, we spent time with the kids before we left, and we spent time with them when we got back. And I took uh, Susan's mother. She loves this mall in Fort Lauderdale called the Galleria Mall. How many of you have ever been to Fort Lauderdale? You know where I'm talking about, the Galleria Mall. It's a very uh, exclusive, very high-class uh, really just a really cool place to go and there's a little restaurant there called the Capitol Grill and I took her and her mom to the restaurant and while we were walking I even took some pictures and some of you may have seen those on my Facebook uh, it's not like being a mall at the Mall of Georgia or, or one of the malls that you go to somewhere around here where they've got Kias and Hyundais and Fords and and those kinds of vehicles in the mall no at the Galleria Mall they put uh, the ghost that's a Rolls Royce and they have Bentleys in there. And I'm walking around, I'm looking at these things. The one that I looked at and took a picture of, $345,000 for the Rolls Royce Ghost. So I bought it. No, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> how many, how many, my house does, it doesn't cost nowhere near that. But here's where I'm going with this. I, I love it when he wrote here, he says, hey, listen, not only do you wither and you die without Christ, you die in your sins, but as you land to the ground, the wind just blows you away. You know what that means? You're no better, you're no different than anybody else. I don't care how much money you think you have. I don't care how much stature you have. I don't care how much power you think you have. When you die in your sin, you're just like anybody else, and you ain't going to take it with you. You're dead, you're gone, you're useless. Amen? That's right. We need to understand that. Don't deceive ourselves. It's important for us to understand that we all have skeletons. But here's the key. How many of you know how to get rid of them? Many of you have already done that. In fact, my prayer is that everyone in this room has already gotten rid of every skeleton in their closet. You know how you do it? You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You realize that He is the only one that has the power through His blood to cleanse your closet. Amen, church? How does He do that? 
He does it by exactly what Paul says. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, he can cleanse us. He redeems us. And then he sanctifies us, and, he, and we are justified in and through his blood. Well, let's get into those three points this morning. You say, well, Marty, my goodness, you're not even into the three points of the message. Absolutely not. We are just getting started. And listen, I've been gone for two weeks. I've got to catch up with you. We may go on for all day. The first point, redeemed. Redeemed. Merriam-Webster describes the word redeemed, defines it as this, to free from captivity by payment or ransom, to release from blame or debt, to free from the consequences of sin. Now, that's in Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Can you believe that they published that? It says to free from the consequences of sin. So let me ask you this simple question this morning. How many of you want to be free from the skeletons in your closet? Good. I'm glad five of you do. Well, I'm going to focus on you five this morning. <clears throat> Every one of us do. Amen? The Bible says none's righteous, no, not one. We all have skeletons in the closet, so I want to be redeemed. Now, I want to give you several verses this morning. In order for us to be redeemed, we must be washed, we must be cleansed, we must go to the throne of Jesus Christ, we must believe that He's the only one that has the power to save us, the only one that has the power to cleanse us. And we must open the door of our heart, open the door of our closet, and we must confess it to Him. Amen, church? You say, well, Marty, I can't remember everything. Well, you tell him what you can remember. And then you say, Lord, whatever sin that I have committed, past, present, and future, I ask for the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse me and to cover me and to make me as white as snow. Amen, church? I want to give you some verses for that. First and foremost, we must understand what sin does. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, notice it up on the screen. It says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. It's like that leaf that falls to the ground. It's dead. It has no nutrients. It's gone. It's useless. It has no life. But, notice what Paul says. But the gift of God is eternal life through what, church? But the gift of God is eternal life through who? Wait a minute. Wait, hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's pause here for a moment. But the gift of God is eternal life through going to church. Write that down, right? Isn't that what that says? You sure? Wait, 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 but the gift of God is how much money I put in the offering plate. It, it don't say that. But the gift of God is how nice I am to my neighbors. Doesn't say that, does it? But the gift of God is how nice I am to everyone else. Doesn't say that. But the gift of God is how much money I have. But the gift of God is how much power I have. But the gift of God is through Jesus Christ. The Word of God, Paul is saying to us, there is no other way of salvation, there is no other way of redemption, there is no other way of cleansing, there is no other way of washing except through Jesus Christ. Are you with me, church? There is no other way. The Word of God says, broad is the gate, but narrow is the path. Broad is the way, but narrow is the path. There are so many people that think that they can get eternal life, that they think that they can get the skeletons out of their closet clean because they've tried to do things. They've tried to accomplish things. They've tried to impress people. They've tried to impress God. And God says, listen, He says the only way that this can take place, the only way for the cleansing, the only way for the washing, the only way for the redemption is through my Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins. There is no other way, church. No other way. I'm finishing up, a, finishing up a book that I shared with Deanna, and I'll be uh, working with some other folks because it's going to become a series on some messages that the Lord touched my heart these past two weeks on preaching. You know, we have, in fact, you've heard it from the pulpit, I've said this a couple of times, and the Lord has really spoke to my heart in the last couple of weeks so during this time of relaxing, this time of just soaking into His Word, and the time I had an opportunity to sit on the side there on the ship and just, just, uh, just enjoy and bask in God's glory. In the book that I was reading, one of the things that really touched my heart, especially during this time of politics, is how much we just come down on politicians. How much we say, oh, how sorry and how everything's so bad. And you know what really struck me? You know why we're in the condition we're in today? It's because of what hasn't been taking place right here in God's pulpits. It's because preachers have not stood in the pulpit and been preaching the Word of God. They have fallen to culture. And I said, Lord, please forgive me. Don't ever allow that to come in my life. Lord, if there's only one person here and it's the audience of you, may I stand boldly before your throne, preach the word of God, and make sure the people know that there is no other way of salvation except through Jesus Christ. There's no way that the closets can be cleaned except through Jesus Christ. Well, 
The next verse, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The whole mission of Jesus Christ was to come and to be your payment for sin. Yes, he did and performed a lot of miracles on this earth, but that was not his mission. His mission was to go to the cross as the Son of God and to shed his blood to be the payment for your sin, giving you the opportunity to receive him as your salvation to be cleansed. Notice in verse You know, we know John 3, 16, but you know, sometimes I think it's important that we not take it out of context. We put the rest of the verses with it. So let me give you verses 17 and 18. It's up on the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, how many of you know that verse by heart? Well, let's look at the next part of it. What does it say? What does it say? For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through who? Through him. So let me ask you a question, church. Is there any other way of salvation except through Jesus Christ? So you see, we say, For God so loved the world that gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But let's understand this. For God sent not His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Notice this. He who believes in Him is not what? So let me ask you this question this morning. Again, this is a place for you to write down in your notes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of your salvation? You see, the Word of God says that you have to believe that. It's not Jesus plus something else. You know, so many people today want us to give them something else. Pastor, I believe that. That's just one thing. That's cool. Jesus is the only way. But isn't there something else I need to do? No. Jesus is the only way. I believe sometimes if I gave somebody a penny and said, listen, if you'll go out and roll this penny down the interstate and say, if you do this, you'll be saved, I bet I'd have people lined up to roll a penny down the interstate because they feel they have to do something. Let me tell you something that's already been done. Jesus did it on the cross for you. That is what we believe. So it says, whoever believes is not judged. He who does, now listen, he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. So therefore, church, I need you to understand this. If you don't believe Jesus Christ is the only way of your salvation, you ain't saved. That's as plain and as simple as I can put it, and it's right here in this book. I'm not going to take anything away from it. I'm not going to add anything to it. That's what it says. Well, redeemed. How many of you this morning would say that you are redeemed? I pray that each and every one of you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Well, we're not done. Point number two. Not only are we redeemed when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but guess what? We are to live a... Come on, it's up on a screen. A Christ-like life, a set-apart life, which means sanctified. We are to be sanctified. We are to live a set-apart, a Christ-like life. Now, I want you to ask yourself this question, yes or no answer. Write it down in your paper because this is just for you. Are you living a set-apart, are you living a sanctified life for Jesus Christ? This is where I said, when you look in the mirror, you cannot deceive yourself. You know what the skeletons are. And sadly, there are some Christians that say, you know what? But I like one of these skeletons. There's a couple of these that I think I just kind of hold on to. I'm not going to open the door. I'm not going to take it out. But every now and then. Are you with me, church? The Word of God says that when I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord, Lord and Savior, that old things are passed away. All things become new. So therefore, I want to exemplify Christ in my life. Are you with me, church? Well, how do I do that? Well, some of us, as the Holy Spirit continues to work in our life and continues to do that nurturing and that growing, it's a daily event. Paul says that I strive every day to live like Christ. We're not perfect, but we strive for the perfection. We strive for the sanctification in Jesus Christ. We strive to be set apart. We strive to be that example. Now, I'm just going to ask you this simple question. I didn't see anybody put this one up on a screen. How about language? Hmm. Don't see that one as a skeleton, do you? Boy, I tell you what. I've been around Christians, and I've heard their mouth, and I think to myself, hmm. You need to take care of that skeleton because that's a sanctification process that needs, to be, that needs to show that you're set apart. If you walk around and talk with a filthy mouth like the rest of the world, guess what? Not much sanctification there. Would you not agree with me, church? So, Pastor, are you meddling? No, I'm not meddling. I'm giving you the Word of God. The Word of God says we're to be set apart. We're to be different. How you talk will display what's in your heart. 
Anybody hear the pin drop? I'll just leave that one alone. There are many others, as you know. But I want you to look up on the screen for me as we read these verses. And church, by the way, I want you to know that as the Lord was giving me this message, you heard me in the prayer this morning that said, hey, listen, the Lord really stirred my heart on this. Just like Paul. You see, I strive every day to be like Christ. And I'm telling you, just like Paul, I fall short. I'm just like you. There are times, in fact, I had to ask one of our members yesterday to forgive me. I was getting ready to set up last night, and man, I got a little testy last night. I didn't have, nobody gave me a number as to where we were supposed to set up the little booth last night. One guy was in my booth space, and I'm thinking, my goodness, this Fellowship of the Hills, we're going to be where we want to be. <laughs> and I got a little testy, and, and I thought, man, I, I, that wasn't right. I shouldn't have been like that. But there was a part of my old self, part of that skeleton that came out. You know, well, what, what kind of testimony would that have been if I'd have walked over and duped it out with a guy that was in our spot? <laughs> Preacher arrested because he got in the wrong spot. <laughs> but just like you, sometimes I have to fight those skeletons as well. Amen, church? I strive for the perfection. I strive to live that sanctified, set-apart life. Look at here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, it says, For by one offering, which is Jesus Christ, he was perfected for all time that those who are, or at all time, those who are sanctified. It is through the offering of Jesus Christ to perfect his saints for sanctification. Romans 8, 13, those what Paul says, is for if we live according to the flesh, you will die. Pretty simple, isn't it? If you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I want to live by the Spirit. I want to put to death all of these skeletons. Romans 12, 1 and 2, one of my favorite verses that Paul, a reminder to me, and he says, therefore I urge you, he says, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your what church? Reasonable service. God says, I'm not asking anything extraordinary from you. I'm just saying it's your reasonable service to live a sanctified life. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, how do I renew my mind? Well, I renew my mind by what I read. I renew my mind by what I watch. I renew my mind by what I, how I ingest things into my thoughts. My little grandson this week, and I was talking to, to Jared about it. I've got to watch what I say on video here. My little grandson I had on um, uh, Enlighten. How many of you listen to Enlighten? It's uh, Southern Gospel music. And uh, he was listening to it, and he says, Pappy, I've not heard country music like that before. Little four year old. Now he loves country music. Now I gotta be honest with you, there are some times I like some country music too. And I said, Well, son, I'm gonna introduce you to some different country music today. And we had a good time. And then I flipped it over to some praise and worship on uh, the message channel, and we listened to some of that. I had that little four year old jamming in the back seat of the car. Now, why is that so important? Because so many of us ingest certain things into our mind by what we listen to, by what we read, by what we watch. The Bible says that if we want to live a transformed, a different life set apart from the world, then we renew our mind and input into its box, this computer, what God wants us to have and what He wants us to learn and what He wants us to do by having a new mind in Jesus Christ. Amen? Why do you think I ask you so many times through the course of the week if you are reading God's Word? Are you getting in God's Word? Are you taking time? I will promise you, you listen, you heard it right here. I will promise you that if you get in God's word, things in your life will change. I promise you that. And if it doesn't work, you come back and see me. But you won't. You get into God's word and your life will change. Things will be different. Well, sanctified life. Well, that's not it. We're going to get to the last point. You say, wow, one more point, yes. How many of you want to know that you're justified? Listen, I want to know that that closet has been cleaned out. How many of you ever do a closet cleaning? Yeah. It's amazing to me when we do a closet cleaning how much of my stuff gets thrown out of the closet. <laughs> to make room for shoes. Amen. But you know what? Just like we do it at our home, we need to do a closet cleaning from time to time, do we not, church? Some of you right now need to do a closet cleaning. I'm thankful that I have been washed, that I have been cleansed. And it is a daily process. There are things that come in my life as I strive to live a Christ-like life, as I strive to be sanctified, that the Holy Spirit convicts me. And I go to that closet and say, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I need to cleanse this closet, Lord. 
But I'm going to tell you what, there's one thing that I am so thankful for, that when I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I stand before the throne of God justified. I stand before the throne of God just as if I have never done anything in that dirty closet. Amen, church? Now, I want you to listen to these verses. Notice this. In Acts chapter 11, excuse me, Acts chapter 13, verse 39, it's on the screen, and it says, And by him, that's Jesus Christ, everyone who believes is what, church? Is justified. Everyone who believes is justified from all things. Now, you know, this is a very important verse because I can't tell you as I'm witnessing to folks, they say, well, Marty, if you only knew my past, if you only knew what I did, if, you, if I could only tell you the skeletons in my closet, Jesus could never forgive me of that. Well, I love that verse that says, look, what's it say? That I have been justified from what church? A few things. One thing, two things, three things. It says I have been justified from all things by which you could not be justified by the law. Amen, church? When Jesus forgave me, he forgave it all, past, present, and future. And my Jesus isn't going to take his salvation back. And I want you to notice this in Titus chapter 3, verses 6 through 7, it says, when, uh, Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been what? Justified by his grace, we, would, we should become heirs according to the hope of of eternal life. I'm going to tell you what. I don't care what this world does to me because I can strut around and I can say I'm an heir to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm an heir to the throne of God. Well, one last verse, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, knowing that a man is not justified by his works. Remember, we talked about that. There's nothing that you can do to bring justification, nothing that you can do to bring cleansing. We're not justified by our works of the law, but by what? But by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by our faith in Christ and not by our works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh can be justified. No flesh can be justified. So I want to ask you this question this morning. Have you been redeemed? Are you living a sanctified life? And are you sure that you've been justified? Are you sure that you've been justified? I want to sing a song for you this morning. It's a very difficult song. It's a song that I've only sung a couple of times. It's a very old song. Uh, yes, it's a southern gospel song. And it's a difficult song for me to sing. That's why I don't sing it a lot, because it's a reminder of who I am. There's a verse in the song, in case I don't make it through it, let me read it to you. Verse number three of the song, it says, Now my sins were many. How many of you can relate to that? The verse in the song says, Now my sins were many, and the price was too great. What's the price of your sin, church? Not by works, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. The price was great. My accusers had gathered... This morning, I rem reminded when I saw that part of that verse and that song, and I thought to myself, justified, I remember my career in law enforcement, and I remember many times standing before the judge and bringing evidence of the crime that this person had committed. And if the evidence presented to the judge or presented to the jury had enough weight to it, guess what they would do? They would convict this person of the crimes for which they have committed. And after the conviction, they were what? Sentenced the crime. Now, each and every one of us will one day stand before the throne of God. When God looks at you, will he see the evidence of your sin or will he see the payment has already been made through his son? You see, as they gathered this verse says, I cried out to Jesus, and he came in my stead. He came as my payment. He told my accusers, I paid all his debt.